so to kind of start off the interview, I wanted to ask questions about, you know, how how you got into law librarianship and and how you found UNT and like success in the program. Um, so I guess first, um, what encouraged you to pursue your master's in information science and law librarianship specifically? Was that something that um, you pursued because you had held positions in law libraries before? Did you have a specific end goal in mind when you were completing the program? Um, or were you just kind of exploring exploring opportunities? Oh, no, good, uh, great question, Emily. I think it was sort of serendipitous uh, with, um, I got my first job working in a law firm library uh, when I was 16 years old. And so I went to um, a high school um, it's now called the High School for Law and Justice, um, and we were able to be exposed. It was for students who wanted to pursue careers in law or law enforcement, and um, we were able to be exposed uh, to professional environments the summer before our senior year. And so I started working there, and as Lisa mentioned earlier, I did have uh, a desire to become an attorney, but the more I worked, uh, in the law firm and met a lot of first year associates and saw the uh, demands of being a first year associate. Um, it started to change my path and trajectory, and I never knew of law librarianship even as a career. <clears throat> and um, I really enjoy uh, people. I like to help people. Um, I like to research information. Um, I consider myself a lifelong learner. And then um, I really like technology. And um, during that time, about 30 years ago, actually, um, it was the advent of the internet. And, um, you know, I was doing a lot of things. I was building my own computers. And so um, law librarianship, it was kind of shifting from the print aspect to digital. And so it was able to combine everything that I was passionate about, which is people, information, and technology. And so that's kind of how I landed. I did work um, in law librarianship. And so when I decided to pursue my master's at UNT, I focused more on information science um, because I was interested in um, the, <clears throat> um, the um, back end of uh, how you know, people retrieved information and data and so forth. And uh, with the more technical eye, technological eye uh, on it. And so that's why I pursued my degree in information science, because I knew I had the experience. And so uh, with uh, learning in the program, I knew that it, when I did uh, go back to law librarianship um, as a career, then I would be well prepared to kind of carve the path I wanted to. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see how everyone um, comes into their degree program uh, and kind of what their goals are or how they change as they go along. Um, and so when you when when we talk about exploring um, opportunities for education advancement, um, one of the important things is to look at a program and figure out how does it fit into my current career or my lifestyle. Um, and what am I going to get out of the program? Um, so what kind of led you to UNT and how did how did you find success into like in the program? Like what I guess what contributed most to um, helping to advance your career? Well, it was a couple of things. So um, uh, before I started grad school, I was working at a firm uh, as a library assistant. And my then director, who's a really good friend of mine and a former uh, UNT um, adjunct professor, Michelle uh, Villagran, uh, then it was Michelle Lucero. She is like, you need to go to library school and you need to, I'm going to connect you with Dr. Yvonne Chandler and she's going to, you know, take care of you and take you under her wing. And, and then I moved to another firm um, uh, shortly after that. And um, that firm, eventually ended up closing down. But the great thing about it is that I got laid off. But uh, while being laid off, I got um, a severance package. And so that gave me a, a lengthy severance package. And so that gave me the bandwidth to say, okay, I'm going to go back and uh, get my master's degree. 
and I had heard about UNT, what a great program it was. And uh, the great thing about it, I was able to participate in the uh, UNT um, cohort in Houston. And so, um, and the one thing I could say about the program that it was uh, online, it was flexible and it was affordable. And so um, I got, my, I started in my, uh, that cohort and then um, I was able to uh, get a job uh, working at Thompson Reuter. So um, at the time and working in IT and I was, you know, considering a career change as well. I was really looking into um, maybe building a path through IT. And um, so I started working there and there I worked very long hours, but um, it made me think about an or article I read um, in one of the uh, emails I get from the College of Information. And uh, one of, um, it was a gentleman in the, he was in the data science pro program. And he said, I remember a quote from the article, it was in Fortune Magazine. He says, UNT treats you uh, not just as students, but as family members. And I think no one uh, better uh, <clears throat> uh, epitomized that than Dr. Yvonne Chandler. And what was funny is that I didn't take um, any classes from Dr. Chandler because I had all this experience in law librarianship. So I was like, I'm not going to take Dr. Chandler's class. And uh, she gave me a hard time about that after the fact, but um, she was uh, a mentor to me and she encouraged me in my career. And she really pushed me back towards law librarianship, um, even though I was thinking about pursuing a career in IT. She really, you know, told me about the opportunities. And like I said, the, the transition was um, moving away from print to digital. So there were a lot more opportunities uh, in the field of law librarianship. And, um, um, you know, you could have, you know, I think one of the things I thought about with the career that it was, uh, as a lawyer, that it was very demanding in, the, in law librarianship, um, you could have, you know, a, a, a great career, but you could still have like work-life balance too. So that was uh, one of the reasons that shifted me towards law librarianship. And then uh, even while I was in school, I was um, at a time when I was working IT, um, I was working 60 to 80 hours a week while in grad school. And my professors were, you know, so understanding and supportive, um, you know, throughout that process while I'm working these long hours, they offered assistance to, you know, working students like me um, throughout the program to, you know, help me finish the program. So I uh, really appreciate that. I uh, really appreciate um Dr. Challenge, she was a big part of my career and steering me back towards law librarianship and then really appreciate the school that it, it, it taught me even, you know, as I had didn't have any work life balance, um, that that's important to have. And uh, I think law librarianship provided that for me. Yeah. And then kind of um, while we're talking about things or people and, and things that that kind of guide you. Um, I wanted to refer back to a, a video that I saw on your LinkedIn page, mm -hmm. and it was uploaded uh, for Black History Month, and you spoke about um, how Robert W. Hainsworth uh, was the first Black Harris County attorney, um, and how you are the first African-American Harris County Law Library director, uh, when you were, like, in reference to representation. Um, and you went on to explain what representation means to you and the importance of carrying on the legacy of people like Mr. Hainsworth. Um, can you kind of share that with us and um, add any other thoughts on representation uh, and how um, the desire to increase representation and um, support for equal justice has helped to like guide your career? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, uh, Robert W. Hainsworth is who our law library is named after. Uh, he was a gentleman that over 70 years ago um, sued um, the Harris County, sued Harris County because he uh, they forced him to sit at a, a colors only table when he came to the law library. And so he sued for opening equal access to justice. And fast forward now, 70 years later, where uh, I, I work uh at the Robert W. Hainsworth Law Library, but we're a division of the Harris County Attorney o Attorney's Office where Christian Menifee uh, is the Harris County Attorney. He's the first African-American oh. attorney 
uh, in Harris County. And I was, uh, you know, he, uh, I was fortunate that he hired me as the first African-American uh, director of the Harris County Law, Li Law Library, which um, uh, means so much to me um, due to the fact that, you know, like I said, 70 years ago, uh, African-American men couldn't even sit at a, you know, a table. He had to sit at a segregated table. And now I'm here to carry on his legacy. And for me, representation matters. Um, I think uh, representation provides equity um, and inclusion for people who are, you know, historically excluded from these type of roles. And um, I uh, looked in the Oxford uh, Dictionary uh, for a definition of representation, and it says, depicting or making present something which is absence. And uh, with Harris County being one of the most eth ethnically diverse counties in the state of Texas and one of the Houston being one of the most diverse cities in the world, I think it's important to have uh, uh, people represented in different roles that have been historically been absent. And so, um, and, you know, and especially in public service, it, it affects uh, in our city and county, there were absence of people and that, that type of diversity. So being able to represent that and being a native Houstonian uh, is just extremely rewarding for me and, and being able to carry on the legacy of uh, Robert W. Hainsworth on promoting equal uh, and open access to justice to all. So we have that uh, if you come into the Harris County uh, Robert W. Hainsworth Law Library, we have um, an exhibit out front all about Robert W. Hainsworth. And across our wall, we have the letters, uh, the phrase promoting equal and open access to justice uh, for everyone. And that's our mission uh, at the library. So I'm happy to carry on that mission. Yeah. And then um, to kind of transition into talking about your current role, uh, at the at the county law library, um, according to your LinkedIn page, you're a legal information professional with extensive experience in project management, business development, team management, and product and customer support. Uh, can you explain and expand on your current role as director of the Robert W. Hainsworth Law Library, uh, and how you envision these descriptions in what you're doing there? So I do all of them. <laughs> As the the director, uh, my my day to day can be different. Uh, on some days, um, I'm out promoting uh, the law library to the community, uh, or I'm uh, talking to our partners about developing programs, or I'm talking to patrons, and uh, all of those skills that I've um, had, you know, uh, and grown in my career are um, helping me now. Like for uh, project management, one of my favorite um, sayings is if you fail to plan, plan to fail. You know, so um, I just finished a huge project with the law pods um, that I'll talk some about more later. And um, team management is uh, uh, a big uh, skill that, you know, I've grown in uh, over my career. And I have a team of 16 people currently at the law library that um, I manage. And one of my favorite quotes, uh, uh, as Lisa mentioned, I'm a member of uh, AALL. And uh, five years ago, I had the opportunity to attend their management institute. It was for uh, new new managers in the profession. And there I got a, um, a definition of empowerment that uh, has stuck with me to this day. It says, empowerment is a conscious delegation of responsibility, authority, accountability within a set of defined constraints. And I've taken that definition with me um, everywhere um, to uh, when I'm managing people, you know, I, it's my job to uh, empower people to be the best versions of themselves and to be them, their authentic selves too, because I feel like I can get the, um, the best out of them and they can get the best out of themselves if I have an environment that encourages that as well. And so, um, yeah, so a lot of things that I did in the past, uh, where there was, um, you know, in my job on the IT side, um, I worked, I did some uh, IT consulting for an oil and gas company where um, we used uh, a system 
for our IT ticketing that um, I eventually used to evaluate and build a system for law libraries that we use to take our requests. So everything I've done in my career has uh, helped me get to the point where I am today, and I try to utilize um, um, experience from the past and not re recreate the wheel, so to speak. Uh, and um, I can't do that without a, a great team. And uh, I'm really a uh, shout out to my team at the Robert W. Hainsworth Law Library. Um, and I'll talk more about my transition from uh, private to public, but uh, they've been a really huge help in, in helping me get up to speed on the public uh, side. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, before, yeah, before you transition to this role, uh, uh, you mentioned working for uh, law practices um, like Oric and, and Blank Rome. Um, so how, how did those prepare you for your new role um, and, and what kind of encouraged your transition from that private sector into the public sector? Uh, yeah, I think uh, what I tell people uh, when I um, was preparing to transition to this new role uh, on the uh, government slash public side is that my job, uh, my, the, my mission didn't change. It's just my patrons and stakeholders did. So uh, when I used to um, onboard new and new attorneys or new professionals on the law firm side, I used to tell them, I'm here to provide you with the right resources at the right time to uh, be able to do your job. And I still say that even um, on the uh, <clears throat> public side, I'm here to provide you with the right resources at the right time to help you achieve your desired outcome. And so um, so my mission hasn't changed. It's just my environment, my patrons and stakeholders have. And so, um, but again, as I mentioned previously, you know, all the experience that I gained on the private side, I definitely bring to the public side. And just because the uh, private sector is, you know, a lot faster uh, than the uh, public sector. I'm able to utilize some of the skills and technology that um, the public sector may not be using yet, but um, it's definitely uh, coming soon. So I'm able to kind of get a head start on this in my new role. And then what brought me to the public sector? Um, I like to really do, uh, um, uh, love, um, uh, break it down to two things. It's uh, inspiration and impact. And uh, inspiration as a public servant, um, my goal is uh, I aim to be an inspirational figure, instilling hope and optimism in those who I serve um, by leading with uh, compassion, integrity, and dedication. I seek to inspire fellow citizens to contribute to the betterment of our uh, county, our city, our society an impact um, and ultimately the true uh, measure of our success as public servants lies in the impact we have on the lives of the people we serve. And so 90% um, of the people we serve here are uh, pro se litigants. Um, they represent themselves and um, they like to, uh, they typically fall into what I call the justice gap. It's like they um, are not poor enough to receive legal aid because you have to qualify for that and you have to um, um, be below the poverty line to be able to qualify for legal aid, but they they don't have enough money to afford an attorney. So they're really the people left in the justice gap and that's what we do. We uh, serve a lot of those people with legal information. Um, I tell our patrons all the time, um, you know, we can only go up to a certain uh, extent because we're not attorneys and we can't provide legal advice, but we're here here to show you the resources that are that's going to help you, and we're going to try to you know do the best of our ability to, to kind of translate that information to help you understand so you can do take the necessary steps to um, remedy your issue. And um, I think um, you know when I think about that and the impact we're making, you know every decision. And policy I advocate for, um, I carefully consider the goal of creating a me meaningful and lasting impact in our community. Yeah. Um, so as we kind of talk about your, or reflect on your transitions um, and the different positions that you've held from, uh, from working in them um, 
at the very, very start of your career and then now to being the director. Um, I feel like you're a really great person to ask about career advancements and making transitions. Um, so how do you how do you kind of decide when it's time to make a change? Mm -hmm. And what kind of advice do you have for professionals who who know that they need to make a change or want to make a change, but they're not sure where to start? Uh, it's simple. Follow your heart. Um, I um, I left Boink Rome uh, to go to Org um, because I felt I really loved it at Boink Rome. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my career there, um, but I felt undervalued, and uh, I left for a temporary role at work for a project uh, where I was just going to be a project manager for a year and a half, but um, I knew it was the right decision for me at the time to leave. I knew work um, as when I took the job wasn't going to be a, uh, it's going to be a temporary role for me, and um and I went there and I got there and I loved it and they loved me and it was a good fit. And within uh, six months, they hired me on full time and it was a great experience. Uh, I learned a lot of new things, but I knew or it wasn't my uh, long term uh, place to be. And so in um, February of last year, the then director of the uh, law library, um, Hainsworth Law Library, approached me and told me he was leaving and that he would like for me to take his place. And at the time, um, I wasn't sure about going into public service because I had been in private um, firms and corporations uh, my entire career. But um, I thought about it and the position became open and I told myself I wasn't gonna apply because I didn't really think my heart was into, um, you know, transitioning to the role and um, I went, I visited um, as a board member, we visit uh, chapter organizations and I went to uh, Atlanta. And there I had a conversation with uh, 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 my wife's cousin uh, about um, living a simpler life and, you know, and having impact on uh, <clears throat> your community and being able to help people. And so, through that conversation, um, I really started to think about impact and not just a, a simpler life, you know, as far as, you know, work-life balance and things like that, but um, being impactful in what I do. And so um, I remember it was almost a year ago um, to this day, I had jury duty and I went, um, after I got our jury, jury duty, I went to have a conversation with the director Merida, who's still here, she was the director before the previous director, um, about the job. And um, I told her, you know, I've shared my concerns and fears and she's like, you would be great for this job. And, um, and, and she said, you should apply. So I applied two days before the job closed, but um, it was the best decision I ever made. Um, I was with Oric in, until June of 23 when they had layoffs mm -hmm. um, at the time. And uh, I was unfortunately laid off, but I had already made up my mind and, and I had applied for this job and I knew the job uh, was going to, I knew I was going to get the job. I just was, you know, knew that this was what I was meant to do. And so um, uh, I had a couple of months off for the summer because um, again, I got a great severance package. And uh, I was able to talk to uh, a lot of different people in the government realm um, at our national conference. I visited some government law libraries from people who I had made connections with in the past, and it just reaffirmed my uh, decision. So I say always when, when you're doing that, follow, follow your heart and um, know your worth too as well. Um, and um, if you do that, I don't think you'll go wrong in uh, making decisions in your career. Yeah. And then um, I, I know you mentioned uh, in that answer talking about, um, you know, people that you've been able to make connections with and how they have helped to guide you through your career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that previously when I when I was able to speak with you in Dr. Ryan's class, 
Um, you mentioned that connections and relationship building are really important to you. Um, can you tell us more about some of the important connections a law librarian makes and how you go about making them? Yeah, every connection is important, uh, whether it be from uh, a, per uh, a patron um, to a judge to another law librarian to uh, the Harris County Commissioner, which is the highest uh, office in the county. Every connection is um, uh, important, and, and it's my goal, um, um, as I share it with the class, and my professional goal is always to move from an interaction to a connection. Um, that's even in, in work uh, when I used to uh, train attorneys on resources. So it's my goal to, you know, move you from interacting with this product to uh, making a connection. They call it making making it sticky, making the product stick. So um, what I do, um, I'm very intentional about relationships. And when I meet, uh, meet someone, uh, within uh, 24 hours of meeting someone, you're going to be either getting an email or a LinkedIn connection uh, from me because uh, some studies show that people forget you within 24 hours. And so um, I try to provide a note or an antidote or something that we had a conversation about just to uh, make sure that, that they remember who I am and then go. Uh, I'm very intentional about, you know, cultivating that relationship for because I feel like uh, I learn best from people um, and collaborating with people. So that's uh, very important to me. Um, I was at a conference in Dallas um, earlier this month and the conference started on Thursday. And uh, by that Friday evening, I knew everyone's name. And I think that's important to me too. If you meet somebody, you learn their name, even, even though I write it down a lot because my memory is not what it once was, but um, it's important to remember people uh, people's name and, and and be intentional about making connections. Yeah. Um, and then um, I previously we we talked about um, uh, your participation in double A double L. Um, and you previously have won um, their innovation tournament. And then recently you were awarded uh, the Houston Bar Association's President's Award. Uh, mm -hmm. So congratulations for that. Um, what are some other professional awards that you have earned? And um, can you tell us more about what, what goes into being in the running for awards or competitions and challenges and things like that? Um, and then what kind of opportunities can come from participating in in those things? Uh, no, this is a, a great question. Uh, it's really three uh, awards I wanna highlight in addition to the um, innovation tournament and this uh, recent award. Um, in 2018, um, I won uh, the Blank Room um, Diversity Award. And, and no way did I go about, uh, and that, that award uh, is for, uh, professionals, excuse me, who uh, demonstrate outstanding leadership in promoting diversity. And uh, it wasn't my intention to, I didn't even know of the award and I didn't even know I was going to win it, but I was just uh, doing some programs just to, you know, make people more of aware of um, our, you know, differences and promote, um, like I did a program on MLK uh, for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And, um, um, I did a program on, it was New York Times did a series on race and it was a, a series of videos that we watched and had conversation about. And it was really uh, interesting uh, conversation, but it wasn't my intent to to do that, to to uh, win the award. But, you know, um, I was fortunate enough to be awarded for that from, and it was a great honor because it was named after um, one of our then partners at the time, Nathaniel R. Jones, who was a civil rights activist and he presented me the award and um it was a, a really really um great great honor um a couple of other awards i won um and and what was good to me was because i was rec recognized outside of the law librarianship profession um law library profession um i was named uh, uh in 2020 a fast case 50 recipient 
uh, and the fast case 50 represents the most fascinating tra uh, trailblazers and architect of the future of law and legal technology. And then in 2021, I was named to the College of Law, uh, a College of Law Practice Management Fellow. And that's uh, the purpose of the college is to recognize, uh, inspire and promote excellence in law practice management uh, and honor uh, extraordinary achievement um, in the field. And so uh, those were really um, huge for me because I was being uh, able to be recognized for my work um, outside of my field of law librarianship um, as a legal technologist. Um, that's one of, uh, I, call, <laughs> I call myself a legal technologist as well. And uh, and then uh, in 2020, um, I was chosen by the American Association uh, of Law Libraries as uh, one of their leadership fellows. And through that uh, fellowship, you receive a mentor and that mentor has been um, just amazing uh, in my career. She's helped guide me, helped me make tough decisions, you know, guided me through that process and um, just has uh, been an incredible um, influence on my career. And then now in 2024, uh, I'm able to, to do the same thing. I'm able to be a, a mentor in that same fellowship to someone. So it's a great opportunity to pay it back. But in all of those awards and things that I've I've uh, been recognized for and achieved. I was available, you know, and that's what I tell people. You you have to be available because um, almost uh, in the innovation tournament, I almost didn't uh, submit for it, but I I think I stayed up the night before and and did the uh, submission and submitted it. And then when I was submitted it submitted uh, into the tournament, then I you know won the tournament, and that was really. Um, a boom for my career because um, people begin to seek me out to speak and talk and it just, you know, brought great opportunities. And, and I don't think that would have happened if I didn't make myself available for those opportunities. Yeah. Um, and then I, I know earlier you, you mentioned law pod. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I know you unveiled um, law pod earlier this month, which is the legal access workspace. Um, which is a really great opportunity to expand uh, legal resources and support to your community. Um, so what creations, innovations, and other projects have you been particularly proud of during your career? Right. Um, I would, uh, uh, we're really excited about the Law Pod. We just opened the first one. It's a, a collaboration between the Harris County uh, Law Library and the Harris County Public Library to take our resources uh, to the community. Um, I think in Harris County is huge. And so um, you have a lot of barriers for people to get to us in downtown Houston, whether it be traffic, uh, parking, uh, um, socioeconomic status. And so we're taking our resources and um, to the community uh, with the Law Pod initiative. And then we're able to partner along with the Harris County Public Library and so I think uh, um, to to answer your question, which creation the the creation for my uh, the innovation tournament tournament uh, was called Seamless Access, and it was where um, during that time period, uh, uh, especially in law firms, people were switching from print uh, access to resources, uh, mostly secondary sources. So. Um, in uh, law, just give you a quick <laughs> legal uh, research lesson. Uh, primary sources are your case law, your statutes, um, your regulations, and then you have secondary sources, which uh, where most people write about these primary sources. And so a lot of the secondary sources, um, the firms were canceling their print access to them because they were available uh, via um, online legal research platforms. And, um, and so uh, what we found is that people were so used to the books, they had a hard time finding these resources online. And so what Seamless Access did, it would provide, it would bypass uh, password authentication because you needed to log in uh, to these online legal research platforms, navigation of the platform. And then in firms, you had to provide client matter numbers uh, where you would charge clients uh, to access these legal research uh, platforms. And so um, 
um, that seamless access bypassed all of that just to take them right to the resource and it's you know back to the providing them the right resource at the right time. Um, uh, same kind of mantra we had, and so uh, that was uh, I was really proud of that because I was the one of the first uh, people to use. Um, we were using single sign-on uh, technology to to get to that process, and so that kind of put me out as an expert in the, the field and I began talking and sharing that information with uh, people because I, you know, in the library community, community, we're all collegial and we like to share information. So um, that was a good one. And then I have a, a new idea that I'm working on developing. Uh, we're going to actually do a, a a pilot of this with one of our JP courts. It's called the Law Pad. So Law Pod is the Legal Access works, Workspace. It's actually a pod. Uh, that you can go into, but the law pad is legal access work workspace at a publicly accessible destination. And it's gonna be the same resources without the pod because a lot of what we see in a lot of government buildings that they don't have the space to uh, house a law pod. So we'll still take them the resources there. It's just uh, like a pad and uh, more of a less uh, iPad experience to simplify uh, for people who uh, are not very technologically savvy. I think that will be really awesome. Those are, I was really excited to see that you were able to unveil those. Um, so I know earlier you also mentioned um, when when you have a plan, plan to fail. And so I kind of want to to look at, look at that a little bit. Um, so I read some of your previous work and I browsed through your LinkedIn. Um, and it is clear to me that you are someone who like really, values looking ahead and seeing, you know, how, how can we improve? How can we innovate or advance? Um, so earlier I mentioned you spoke on representation and in that same video, you mentioned a quote from Dr. King about the importance of moving forward, even when we must do so slowly. And then additionally, you have written about the importance of failing forward. Um, how have these ideas helped you in the face of failure and challenges? Um, and what do you say, what might you say to students who hold back because they fear failing or who are struggling to move forward as they deal with failure? Yeah, this is uh, uh, the Dr. Queen, Dr. excuse me, Dr. King quote is one of my favorite quotes. Um, it says, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And what advice I would give to a student is, um, and I would give this to my younger self too, is don't ambush your ambition. I think a lot of time we second guess ourselves and um, and take risk, you know, uh, and it's okay to make mistakes. I think um, what I, I saw a quote that said, failure is not the opposite of success, it's part of success. And so that's the uh, advice I would give to someone. Yeah, that's, I, uh, give that similar advice to my students. Um, <laughs> um, and then so kind of to tr change trajectory just a little bit, um, I wanted to talk about professional organizations um, and keeping up with, an, with a profession that evolves so, so rapidly. Um, so you're an active member of AALL and other professional organizations. Uh, what do you get out of uh, being a member of those organizations and um, how 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 important are they to your career and your development as a law librarian? Yeah, um, um, I think um, active involvement in organ organizations like AALL provide me with invaluable opportunities to meet and connect and serve individuals who continually um, inspire and enlighten me. And so that's what I get out of the process. And uh, what I would tell somebody, a student who's interested in uh, law librarianship, um, AALL has a student membership. It's uh, fairly inexpensive compared to the cost of a regular membership. And they provide you with so many resources and people um, that can help you in your career. And then um, also, um, another inexpensive way to get in the law librarianship, which I kind of started out is, is uh, volunteering is on the local level. So if you have a local chapter, like for 
um, I believe like the, the Dallas Fort Worth area, they have the Dallas area law librarians. And then they also have the Southwest Association of Law Librarians, um, which I uh, just attended their conference early this month in Dallas. Um, I think they just uh, increased their dues to $25, but I think the student membership may be uh, even less than that. But that's a great way to get started uh, in your local organization because you can get access to the education um, um, programs and tools and get access to the people as well that will benefit your career. So that I would definitely recommend that for everyone. Yeah. And then um, in addition to being part of these organizations, um, what are some things that you do to continue to grow professionally um, outside of those, whether that's workshops, classes, seminars, anything like that? Yeah. Um, um, so I think one of my biggest faults is I, I never say no to anything. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I talk about being available, so, but sometimes you have to say no, um, uh, uh, cause you find yourself doing way too much and wearing yourself out. But, um, no, I, I, I'm, you know, I go to conferences, um, I volunteer to speak, um, um, at conferences or, you know, on sessions like these. And I work closely with, um, colleagues, um, because I'm, uh, dedicated to contributing to this profession that has deeply impacted my career and personal growth. And, um, one colleague I'm especially grateful for is uh, here today, Dr. Sarah Ryan. Uh, we've been able to collaborate on uh, a number of different projects that um, uh, go about um, building a pipeline to our profession as well as championing uh, law, law librarianship. So uh, I'm very thankful uh, to Dr. Ryan. Uh, uh, glad I got the opportunity to meet her and she's you know, continuing the work that uh, people like Dr. Yvonne Chandler before her uh, did in the work at UNT in the College of Information. So thank you, Sarah. Outside of joining professional organizations, um, do you have any any more advice that uh, you have received and want to pass on to uh, law library students um, or any extra advice of what they should jump into while they're still learning and growing and as students before they learn and grow as professionals? Yeah, it's it's really simple. Um, I was uh, at the national conference for the American Association of Law Libraries, and we had an event for like newer, newer law librarians. And uh, in the session, they were talking about uh, having them prepare for success at the conference. And they gave three pieces of advice to learn, meet people, and have fun. And I've kind of taken that and, and ran with it. Um, uh, when um, I'm giving advice to people coming into the profession, learn as much as you can. You, know, you have to be a lifelong learner. Um, uh, meet people. As I said, I'm big on connection and connecting with people. Um, um, and then have fun. You know, I'm a big firm believer in working hard, but I party even harder. <laughs> so I love to have fun. I love to have a good time. I love to have fun in what I do. I think um, work should be fun. You should enjoy it um, as well. And if you enjoy it, then you'll, um, you know, you'll last longer. And, and um, so, yeah, learn, meet people, have fun, um, stay abreast of, you know, all the new technology. I know generative AI is, um, has been the new, it topic uh, uh, as far as uh, for on the legal information side, at least um, as well. But, you know, I stay abreast of everything, um, these topics and, um, you know, uh, be available too. And I'll, I'll go back to that, you know, be available for opportunities. You never know where an opportunity is going to take you. I'm a firm uh, believer in a, a great example of just um, my availability, um, being able to to help elevate me in my career.